Hi, I'm Jonathan Larson with TYT Investigates. And on today's edition of TYTI Daily, I'm speaking with Zena Spazakis, who's running for Congress in the 9th Congressional District of New Jersey. She's running against Bill Pascrell, an incumbent Democrat who's been there for quite a while and is often considered a progressive. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to reach out to Zena because of the stuff going on with the post office. President Trump has come down hard on the post office lately, talking about how it needs to raise stamps, start competing in a business, all this stuff. And Bill Pascrell, the incumbent, got a lot of his attention for his defense of the post office. Uh, Zena Spazakis is not exactly having it so much. And, and Zena, I do want to get to what you have to say about it. First, I want to read a quote from uh, Bill Pascrell earlier this year. He wrote, since 2007, America's post offices have been slowly strangled by an outrageous obligation that has single-handedly hindered the post office and hastened its ability to function at the high levels our nation deserves. Um, I think he meant impaired. Uh, impaired its ability to function at the high levels our nation deserves. He's referring to the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act of 2006, which Bill Pascrell voted for over to you, Zena. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it's nice to claim outrage for something that was voted for uh, over 12 years ago. What that uh, act did, um, specifically what he's referring to, is that uh, the law mandated that the post office uh, pre-fund uh, pre medical benefits for its retirees going out uh, decades. Um, didn't touch, pe touch pensions, uh, but what what, what it basically did um, is it put a liability uh, on the balance sheet of the U.S. Postal, soft, uh, postal Office. Um, the, the interesting thing about it is that even though uh, that law mandated uh, that the post office pre-refund on an annual basis these liabilities, it has defaulted. Um, it actually isn't funding uh, these liabilities. Um, and in one of their recent uh, financial statements, the reason that they gave uh, and I'm paraphrasing, was in order to um, keep the liquidity of the postal, uh, the postal Service, which, you know, we could talk about um, its business model and it's where it generates revenue, but that's basically what he's referring to. It is, um, uh, it is one thing to complain about it. In actuality, what has happened is that the post office has not uh, paid these. Um, its top line revenue uh, for the last decade or so, it has probably is, you know, trended about 70 uh, at about $70 billion a year. That hasn't changed. What has changed is the environment that, his, that this business model, which is stuck in the past, hasn't adapted to what's happening uh, right now. We could talk about that as well. But. So yeah, I do want to get to who you are and the nature of your campaign and all that. The, the post office stuff is obviously very much in the news right now. So I do want to hit some of, these, some of these points and talk, really get into the weeds a little bit on some of the things you're, you're interested in prescribing for the post office. I want to stay in 2006 just for a minute. He, he writes that congressional Democrats at the time were, quote, rushed into voting for this act. And um, at the risk of giving you a total <laughs> softball, uh, <laughs> take a free swing at, at your, your opponent, um, what, do you, what do you make of that? A, a guy who says that he cast a wrong vote, he admits today it was a wrong vote, but says he was rushed into voting for it. Well, um, then that uh, shows me at least a lack of uh, credibility and a lack of leadership. Um, it is hard to be, um, it takes a lot of, it, it's very easy to complain about things. I think it's much tougher to actually show uh, leadership even when it's politically inconvenient. Um, I'm sure there was probably some rushing back in 2006, but you know what, I voted, I vote for Democrats, um, especially ones who claim they are progressives in order to fight for progressive policies. Um, and if he's not, you know, with all due respect to the congressman, if he's not able to do that job, then we need a change in our leadership. And his, his thinking right now on the post office, uh, I just read a, a piece, which I, I found a lot to admire about, that he wrote earlier this month, talking about the history of the Postal Service, some of which I was not aware of, and how it was semi-privatized. And he's, he's really um, advocating a, a fairly radical, although also historic, Right, this was mainstream America, but at the in, in the times we find ourselves, it's a fairly radical vision where he's saying it should be entirely governmental. It should not have to operate like a business, and it should be a hub of a lot of government life and contact for people in terms of things like voting, uh, paying your taxes, even even uh, banking, things along those lines. 
And he, he says specifically, he, he wants it to be a cabinet position. And he says he doesn't want it to run like a business. So I'm, I'm curious, you say he doesn't go far enough, but you still say you want it to run like a business. So, so help me reconcile where you think you are on the scale compared to him. Uh, so I don't think it should be run as a business. I mean, what um, if we look at history, uh, I think it, I believe it was Richard Nixon who had implemented quite a bit of reform uh, for the Postal Service, which kind of forced it in the direction of trying to run as a business. Um, you know, it, it, the Republicans tried doing this. Uh, unfortunately, they failed in their implementation because they shackled the Postal Service with a lot of unreasonable uh, demands. Uh, that being said, I believe the Postal Service should be uh, should not be run as a business. Its role in the economy is far too vital. It delivers 150 billion pieces of mail a day. It's prescriptions, it's ballots, it's magazines. I mean, there are primary effects to having this thing, uh, having the Postal Service go insolvent, and then there's secondary effects. It would have a tremendous impact um, on our economy. What, um, what I believe uh, should happen is, yes, we should, I actually agree, we should add some more uh, functions to the Postal Service, one being um, postal banking. Uh, the country, this country had postal banking from, I think, roughly about 1910 to about 1966 is when uh, Lyndon Johnson got, did away with it. Our society right now looks a lot more like 1910 than it did in 1966 with respect to inequalities. But um, you know, we could we could talk about the banking deserts and the fact that you know 25% of Americans are either unbanked or underbanked, and we have predatory, you know, effectively loan sharks, uh, all legal, going in and uh, charging egregious fees to the people who can least afford it. Um, that's one function that the Postal Service uh, can do. Um, I also believe that we need to, the government right now needs to step in and make sure that it does not go insolvent. If you want, if you want, if President Trump wants to see a recession, the fastest way he can get one is by uh, allowing the uh, Postal Service to go under. Um, I'm not sure what he's trying to do there. So, so you, um, you said you're, you're not, you don't support um, running the post office like a, a business. Your, your campaign gave me a statement saying that you do support applying the generally accepted accounting principles. Um, so, so tell me a little bit more about your vision for it, specifically where it differs from Pascrell, right? If, 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 if your campaign and your position is basically, he's not going far enough. So tell me, tell me the, where you want to go that he's not going. And then we will move on to your signature issue because <laughs> it's climate, climate change. Yeah. People should yes. know if you're bored of post office, we're getting to the big one in a minute. But, <laughs> um, but in the meantime, tell us a little bit about the daylight right. between you and Pascal. Right. And yeah. Um, so I, it, one of the biggest differences I think between myself and the Congress uh, Congressman is uh, is the fact that I have um, my 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 campaign, my platform is entirely progressive. I don't, I don't take money from any postal unions. I don't take any money from corporations. I don't take any money from, um, um, from special interests. Uh, my only concern is uh, the health and well-being of our constituents, frankly, of Americans, uh, specifically our, the folks in my district. Um, with respect to the actual policies to uh, the U.S. Postal Service, I would, I would basically just take that, uh, that should just become a federal agency funded by the Treasury as the, as the founders had originally framed it to be. Um, and it should be a, if, you, if we talk about too big to fail, the Postal Service is the poster child of something that is too big to fail. Um, and, you know, whether, whether that is, you know, whether it's going to upset um, private companies that I want to effectively, I mean, nationalize the Postal Service, um, that, is, that is too bad for them. It is the best thing for my constituents, many of whom um, live um, in uh, low-income communities where co even community banks have left the area um, and we need to start providing. I think we can. I think we could take the situation and kill sort of two birds with one stone. Let's provide banking services to communities who need it. They can, you know, it's it's uh, it, those are crucial to uh, their financial well-being and to our economy. Um, and then also let's solve uh, the um, uh, the postal service issue because that is just critical to so many industries uh, in our economy. So. so, so at the risk of making myself a fibber for saying we would get right to climate change, I do want to ask one quick follow-up, okay. which yeah. was you, you uttered a word that politicians in this country really don't like to say out loud, which is yeah. nationalize. And I realized you weren't necessarily talking about the, the sort of draconian 
image that a lot of people have of, of nationalizing something, and which in this case, by the way, is of course already semi-governmental. Right. But but if the if the functions and the utility of the post office uh, are so fundamental to our 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 existence as a nation, are there are there other areas that you think warrant nationalization of, of some form? So uh, I'm not sure whether you would call this nationalization or not, but I'm also a supporter of Medicare for All. Um, I actually wrote an op-ed a few months back on this, and I looked at it from, uh, from a purely, like a, it's a moral issue, of course, but it's an economic issue as well. Um, you know, my, uh, uh, my opponent has taken over $1.1 million in just corporate contribution, contributions from big pharmaceuticals and healthcare, uh, while our, our district has some of the highest uninsured rates in the entire state of New Jersey. Um, so, you know, when you look at uh, our healthcare system, which is roughly a third administrative of which that, a large part of that can be done away with because really we don't need 500 plans to you be mean administered. one third of the costs, you mean? I, you know, if you look at it purely from a, uh, from a cost perspective, I mean, there's multiple studies, but the one that uh, comes to mind, uh, one of the more recent one was one out of Yale, where um, Yale uh, epidemiologists, I the scientists basically figured out that, you know, if we, if we go to a Medicare for all system, we will save, not only will we save 68,000 lives annually, but we will also save $450 billion annually. So the big, you know, sort of Republican talking point of like, how are we going to afford this is actually... It's, it's actually, a, I mean, it's a big bluff. Um, how can, we can't, we can't afford our current medical system, which is growing at about five to 6% a year. Um, I mean, that's just nuts. And if you want to take that back to the uh, postal service, you know, part of the problem with this pre-refunding medical benefits is because it assumes that we're going to have the same costly medical system, Right. If we got, if we trim down the costs, we run it, if, you know, we run it efficiently as a government program. And oh, by the way, Jonathan, we have a lot of that infrastructure already in place within the government to get that done. Now, I mean, I don't know if you look at my background, I have an MBA. Uh, so I, I get, I understand how to build these things out. It would be one thing if we're proposing a Medicare for all system where we have zero infrastructure, but we have like 99% of it already in place. We would have to expand it in order to start, you know, covering uh, people at lower, uh, younger and younger ages. Uh, but that's another area where I think the government um, needs to step in uh, because it's broken right now and it's not working. So um, you got into politics, not just this race, but you got into politics because of the issue of climate change. Can you, can you tell that story? Yes. Um, so I, you know, I'd been an environmentalist for years. Uh, I left a two decades long career on Wall Street, honestly, to go into clean energy because I saw what was happening. Um, you know, I also study the science uh, at a graduate program. I read the UN's IPCC report, that stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, back in the fall, late fall of 2018. Um, and at that, uh, at that time, um, when you have the world's best scientists telling you, you need to cut your emission by about half in the next 12 years, otherwise, you know, <laughs> uh, we risk a lot of bad things happening. Um, it terrified me, not because we had 12 years, but because every single climate model that I've ever um, studied or analyzed has always overestimated the amount of time in which we have to react. Things, uh, climate, the climate crisis, climate change is simply happening much faster, much faster than most scientists could have predicted we could talk about why that's, but that's a whole nother segment. Uh, suffice it to say, we don't have 12 years. We have a lot less. We are a fossil fuel-based global economy right now. That, is, that worked for us in the 20th century, but it's not going to work for us in the 21st century. Um, and I got into this race because I had been voting Democratic for years. Uh, and when I vote for somebody with a D next to their name, I expect them to do something to ensure that our children have a future. My kids are eight and six years old. You know, they're going to be, they're going to be about my age when we're living through the worst of the climate, uh, at some of the beginning of the worst of the climate crisis um, in another 50 years, right? Um, so if I'm voting Democrat, I better, I better be assured that they're doing something aggressively about this because this is the existential crisis um, of our species, our species, every other species on the planet as well. Um, 
And I, when I saw he really didn't have any lead, he hadn't taken any leadership positions in these, he has taken money from fossil fuels. Talking about Pascal now, the economy. Yes, yeah. Actually, what happened is I, I, um, I declared at the beginning of March, uh, about a week after that, he comes out in support of the Green New Deal. And I kid you not, 12 days after he comes out on NPR in support of the Green New Deal, you see checks coming into his campaign from uh, fossil fuel uh, special interests. Um, it's all public information. So it's one thing. I will not stand for a politician who will sit idly by while our, fu- our kids' futures are being destroyed and it pays lip service just, be- just so he can get the next election. That is unacceptable to me. I want a politician who has the courage to fight for this because this is a threat to all of us. It doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent. This is, this is the threat we have to deal with. So when I, when I hear people say, you know, Democrats have to come together, we have to support the nominee, no more infighting, all this stuff. I, I, I push back on that a lot, um, in part because of exactly what you're just talking about, which is that, let's say under the most cynical uh, scenario, you announce your signature platform issue is climate change, and then a week later, Pascrell uh, says that he endorses the Green New Deal. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want him to move that way? Do, do, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is, is there more that you want from the guy other than embracing the signature legislation of your, your keystone issue? Absolutely. He needs okay. to start introducing policy. I mean, whether it's policy that's regional here that affects New Jersey and the Northeast or whether it's, uh, it's you know, uh, U.S.-wide policy. I mean, it's one thing to say for it. And quite frankly, Jonathan, the laws of physics are not waiting for anybody. Okay, we need to get this done and it needs to be acted upon quickly. Okay, I, I, we're, fighting, we're not fighting Republicans here, right? We're fighting the laws of physics uh, and chemistry. Um, you know, if, let's, let's get legislation that eliminates fossil fuel subsidies. The fossil fuel industry still takes billions of dollars of taxpayer money in subsidies. Why? You only pay financial subsidies to an industry in theory when it is starting and when you want to support it in order for it to get to profitability. Fossil fuels are a 200 year old industry. And quite frankly, if we, one of the biggest things we could do is eliminating policy, policy, uh, excuse me, subsidies because with these subsidies, a lot of fossil fuel projects are economic. Without these subsidies, frankly, a lot of them, most of the stuff would stay in the ground. Uh, they become uneconomic. Um, you know, there, <laughs> you see, you know, one of the, one of, I've been seeing uh, Trump recently, you know, talk a lot about, you know, OPEC and like getting together and trying to control prices in the oil industry. The thing that he's not talking about is the fact that at these oil, uh, at these prices of oil, the cost structure of a lot of these companies, I mean, they become bankrupt. I mean, we had a banker, we had Diamond Offshore just declare bankruptcy a couple of days ago. It is, a, it went from a major company to a penny stock right now. The trading was halted and that's going to happen. Uh, and the longer that these prices stay where they are, you know, that's going to happen. But I, instead of bailing some, uh, an industry out like that, let's start implementing, here's another policy. Let's start thinking about and implementing transitions of our workforces into renewable energies, into clean energies. The two biggest wind producing states in this country are Texas and Iowa, not exactly bastions of you know <laughs> liberalism or progressivism, right. right? There's a lot of good jobs there and these jobs can't be exported. These can't be exported. If we just build our wind infrastructure in the middle of this country, we have some good quality, high paying jobs. And oh, by the way, you're not gonna die of like black lung you're not going to die in a fire or an explosion, and your kids are not going to breathe bad air. Um, so, and of what's course, the Trump's, Trump's answer to this to help the industry is to tamp down supply, which means that American consumers have to pay more. Like he's literally trying to raise prices so that money will go from American consumers to the fossil fuel companies. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I can't speak to his relationships to the fossil fuel industry, but I, I want my presidents to work for people, not corporations. <laughs> well, I, I, I thank you for the segue because uh, TYT has an investigative reporter who's focused on climate change, a guy named Tiwa Chang, who you may know, used mm-hmm. to be on TV in a lot of the local New York markets. Uh, he did a story earlier this month about a billionaire donor of President Trump's, a guy named Harold Hamm. He's the founder of Continental Resources, and they're one of these companies that's pushing for federal help. But the reality is, 
when, when, even when Trump talks about um, saving fossil fuel jobs, this is not a high uh, manpower personnel industry. They use very few people given the amount of money they make. And uh, as Tiwa reported, in the case of continental resources, but also across the industry, when you give them money, like many companies, what they try to do with that money is invested in things that let them hire fewer people. Well, I mean, that's, that's what they're incented to do, right? Their, their only incentive is to maximize, is to increase the top line, decrease their costs and maximize their profits. I mean, that's, they're acting like rational. Uh, that's a completely rational response from them, right? I, so I don't, uh, you know, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, if, if, if you truly want to save this economy, instead of bailing out uh, corporations, especially the ones in industries that are in the long-term structural decline, Fossil fuels are not a growth industry. That's not where you want to be looking for work. Why, why don't we just start moving these resources into renewables? We can manufacture the wind turbines and all the equipment in the United States. We need wind turbine technicians. If we put them on farmland, we, the farmers will, will, will collect rents. I mean, it is, it is even, even at the state level, it's a really and, yeah. and royalties. I mean, it's, you know, and we have energy security, right? And the other thing, you know, I hear a lot about, well, you can't really, you know, the wind doesn't, you know, the sun doesn't shine at night. We have some incredible technologies that the department, ever, we need to increase our research and development into battery storage technologies. We have some great options already, but we, we can become quite self-sufficient um, on, on renewables if we just had the political will to do so. I was really glad to hear you mention how, how the, um, the, corporate urge to shed themselves of personnel is a rational one given the cost structures and the incentives that have that have arisen around them and uh we we we've done a lot of work on this before the trump tax cuts tyt investigates we did a series looking at a lot of big companies fedex ups apple that were saying if you give us tax cuts that creates jobs and we showed how they actually plowed their past windfalls into things like offshoring, outsourcing, and automation. All of this stuff that, that essentially lets them make more money. And you see it in Wall Street, right? Anytime a company lays people off, the stock price goes up. And, and all of that's my long-winded way of getting around to, um, you mentioned that Republicans aren't the enemy earlier. And you did not see back before the Trump tax cuts, you did not see Democrats, the Democratic elected political leadership saying, wait a minute, these companies are not going to use this money to hire. Uh, where are you on the Democratic leadership? You can say the words Pelosi and Schumer anytime, but, but I'm not necessarily trying to you and him fight. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, what we've at least, you know, I, I, I'm a child of the, uh, I'm a ch I, I was a teenager in the late 80s. Um, and what I have seen over the last few decades, and I, you know, I kind of was always interested in politics, but what I've seen in the last few decades is a shift. I don't know who's caused it. I don't know who allowed it. Um, a shift of our, of what is considered a centrist opinion to the right. Right. I mean, to the point where, frankly, someone like Joe Biden and his policies and his history would be considered a right, you know, sort of a right leaning uh, politician in most European countries. Right. Sure. Um, our, you know, there I th our lead our Democratic leadership grew up in a very different generation than the millennials or even uh, even me as a as a Gen Xer. Um, we are not afraid of, uh, of doing what's right for people, right? Uh, we uh, believe that if, cor if politicians take money from corporations and special interests, especially in the sums that they do now and they fundraise through those, are they really working for our interests, right? Those are the card questions that we ask of our leadership. And frankly, if our, if our leadership has, has been unable or, you know, worse, unwilling to stop sort of this trend to the right in our policies, then it is time for new leadership because what we're because the what we've seen the effect is increasing inequalities to the point where you know we were talking about the postal banking system right the United States now looks more like 1910 than it did 1966. Um, we've seen a degradation of our climate 
right? Thinking, okay, I'm going to, we've known about the climate crisis for 40 odd years, right? Let's, oh, we're going to do it next year. We're going to do it next year. Well, you know what? We can't do it next year because I got the laws of physics over here and they're telling me something completely different. The degradation of our climate. You know, I have, uh, New Jersey is one of the most polluted states. Our kids have higher rates of asthma, right? We are, we are, our policies are simply not working. They're not working, you know, and for politicians to come out and sort of, you know, distract you over here saying, you know, to, to clutch their pearls and say, oh my God, isn't it terrible what Trump is doing? And look at all these policies. I'm like, but what have we done in the last 40 years to stop this, right? The Republicans have been quite active, I think, uh, in moving a lot of these conversations to the right, but we, we have not been. Um, and you talked a little bit about party unity. You know, um, yesterday, was it yesterday or the day before, New York State basically canceled uh, its primary, uh, which essentially I have been a very public and ardent Bernie Sanders supporter, um, and I've endorsed him, uh, but they canceled the primary, right? And that basically, basically a delegate rich state like New York uh, basically just told the progressive movement, we don't want your ideas because we're not allowing you to vote for Senator Sanders so he can collect um, so he can collect uh, delegates. That is, it was, I mean, everybody I know who was progressive was livid about this because if you want our votes and you want our volunteers and we are very active, you know, we, we don't come out every four years. We are active every year, all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's a process. I mean, let's, let's see some, let's see some progressive policies. And you, quite frankly, it's not that they're unpopular. The majority of Americans <laughs> like Medicare for all. I mean, most people think we should be taking decisive action on the climate, but what has stopped this? It's been money in politics. You know, I mean, if I want to get very cynical, I'm like, are you going to, are, am I going to, if I, if, if you're a politician, you're taking millions of dollars from like these, you know, corporate benefactors over here, who really are you working for? Right. I mean, that's the cyn cyn cynic in me. One of, one of the things you, meant, you, you sort of touched on is something I neglected to ask you about when we were talking about the Postal Service, which is uh, voting by mail. It was on my list, and, I, and I'm afraid I skipped it, but I'm so glad you brought up New York canceling uh, the, its primary. Tell me your position on, on voting by mail and why. Well, uh, I think during a pandemic where you see uh, lower turnouts in primaries, which already in and of themselves have low, tur are low, low turnout events, uh, I think what you want to do as a Democratic Party is try to implement policies that will get the most vote, that will give the opportunity to the most voters to cast their vote. I mean, that's sort of like a core right we have as a democracy um, to do anything. To hinder that is frankly, in my, my uh, I think is disenfranchisement of voters um, because you know they're not gonna show up to the polls. People are terrified to like stand next to each other outside. Why would they wait online in a poll? Uh, you know, we already, the, the infrastructure's there, right? We have voter data, we have their addresses, we know where they live. Let's send them a piece of mail, uh, have them vote and have them send it back to us postage paid. Not that difficult, right? Right, but is there is there the political will to do that? I don't know why the Democratic. I mean, here in New Jersey, it's actually kind of a big deal. We had a day of activism where we called into the governor's office, say, you know, we need to have this uh, vote by mail, vote by mail. Why is this happening? Vote by mail. Um, you know, I the the again the cynic in me would say the the more turnout you have in an election, the more it helps progressives. Quite honestly, because those are the ones that here at least here in New Jersey who are actively campaigning. So um, and Phil, Phil Murphy, the governor here, has been uh, pretty uh, broadly praised, I think, for his handling of the coronavirus crisis. But it doesn't seem clear, at least I'm not aware, of where he's going to come down on voting by mail. And I'm wondering whether you've got anything to say to our governor. <laughs> well, you um, can share anything about where he is and the efforts to get him yep. where you think he should be. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what his thinking is. Um, you know, I... Uh, I know I tried, and a lot of my friends tried calling into his office. We got busy signals uh, or voicemails that were completely full. Um, we, I, I, you know, even here locally, even let's get even more granular here in Patterson, in uh, Passaic, the Passaic County clerk here uh, just uh, came out and said, it's going to be, uh, we have a special election in Totowa and um, uh, Passaic here. Uh, it's going to be an all vote by mail thing. Uh, we're sending you ballots. You can send them in pre postage paid. Not that hard, right? Uh, for the May 12th special election. Um, we can get it done. Um, I, 
you know, I, I, I don't know what the motivations are for the political Democratic Party bosses here. Um, I don't you know. You kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I don't want to, this is, I, we're getting into the area of opinion uh, rather than actual factors. I don't have anything to, you know, sure. uh, to put behind this. But, you know, traditionally here in New Jersey, um, I don't know, Jonathan, if you're familiar with the uh, uh, ballot design here in New Jersey. It is one of the most corrupt, if not the most corrupt de ballot designs in the country. It essentially... Um, on the ballot, when you walk into the voting booth, you have pieces of real estate. You've got, you know, the Park Avenue piece of real estate, and then you've got, you know, the not Park Avenue piece of real estate. And the and it's supposed to be a random process and a random draw, but if you look at the numbers, it's nothing but random. Uh, but the incumbents traditionally get the prime real estate here, and that's because the party bosses want to protect their seats. And as a result of that, I think what happens is that, you know, because they have this ballot placement, they don't actually need to go out and try to earn the vote or campaign or canvas or hold physical town halls or even respond to their uh, constituents' letters and requests, right? Um, if you have, in a vote by mail scenario, right, where um, you have, and for the first time in forever here in New Jersey, we have a strong progressive slate of candidates who are actively uh, getting the word out. I mean, we've done, we've knocked, pre-COVID, we knocked on tens of thousands of doors, and post-COVID, we've dialed thousands of people, right? We're getting the word out. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if, when you have a vote by, when you have a vote by mail situation, um, where, you know, no one is out electioneering in front of the polling places telling you who to vote for, you actually have to look at the ballot and say, huh, let's see, Zena Spazak has actually contacted me and talked to me about this, and she wants to know what my concerns are. What has Bill Pascrell done for me lately? You know, so you can follow that sort of logical, uh, where that would lead logically. That is terrifying because if we man in the last, I think it's uh, the statistic of 30 or 40 years, we, no challenger has ever unseated an incumbent here. We are fighting a huge uphill battle. In the primary. Oh, in the primary, sorry, right. yes. Um, yeah. it's, not, it's not because there, are, there haven't been worthy challengers. There have been. And it's not because our incumbents are spectacular. Most of them will not support Medicare for all, for example, in, in, in the big pharma state. Okay, <laughs> I mean, that tells it all. Um, you know, that, uh, that's what we're fighting. It's, it's, um, it's just very um, construed to having certain outcomes, um, the system here. So, In other words, it's not yeah. just that Republicans, hey, they don't want to do vote by mail. Democrats, at least in New Jersey, are also capable of, of getting their thumb on the scale for the outcomes they want. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what you should also, you should look at what happened in Hudson County, uh, in Hudson County, which is part of my district a little bit, uh, initially when, uh, the, when Bernie Sanders early on was doing really, really well, um, the, uh, Hudson County, uh, party boss basically said, she said, okay, we're going to decapitate the line. So we're not going to have Bernie Sanders and all his progressive folks like me underneath him on the ballot. And then Biden or Bloomberg or whoever it was at the time and all the incumbents, we're going to decapitate it because, you know, we're just, you know, <laughs> no That's reason so given or some lame excuse uh, given. Bernie Sanders was doing well. When the establishment got behind Biden and Bernie uh, dropped out, you know, all of a sudden that worry just miraculously disappeared, miraculously disappeared. I don't know what happened. Maybe they had a change of heart, but I mean, it is so obvious to the people who actually follow this. But the problem is most, most people are too worried about surviving and especially during this pandemic about putting food on their table that they're not going to notice. The only way they're going to, the only way they're going to know this is happening is if we have challengers who go out and tell them that this is happening, right? Um, or who go out and ask them for their vote. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to use the word corrupt, but it is, it is a fine line. There's, um, there's a couple things I, I want to drill into just a little bit with you. But first, I do want to give you a chance um, to sort of just talk about your background as a person as it relates to your race, your decision to get into politics, how you see the world, if there's anything you want to share. I wanted to give you a chance to do that before I, before I hit you with a couple of these things. <laughs> um, oh, I appreciate it. Well, um, well, I'm a, I'm a first generation immigrant. Um, my parents uh, em, uh, met in Athens, uh, immigrated uh, to the United States here. My father's family is actually from Egypt. Um, 
I grew up in New York City, actually in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district in Astoria. Uh, I went to public high school. Uh, I went to Stuyvesant High School in New York City, so I'd always been interested in sort of science and math and all that stuff. Um, if people don't know, that's an amazing high school that's okay. very hard to get in, and everyone who comes out of it is basically just like a freaking genius walking <laughs> on the cloud. So people oh, should understand. Right. Just what cachet that has in New York City. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, well, th thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so, you know, I decided, I, I wanted to be a national, quite honestly, but I, you know, I graduated college with a degree in economics and uh, government. And I, uh, you know, I think as a reaction of being so sort of financially insecure as a child, because my parents were pretty poor until, and they had a small business. Um, and, you know, they did well after a while, but uh, I went into Wall Street, spent a couple of decades there, um, pretty much just building and operating companies. I was, I was on the operations side. So I understand, um, how, you know, the, I understand the leverage points you have in industries, right? And I understand <laughs> how to sort of dismantle. I tell people, I'm like, you, you know, my resume screen does not screen progressive. Uh, but I tell people I'm the type of progressive that understands business, knows how to dismantle something that isn't working for people and knows how to uh, build it up so that it does. Um, went to grad school um, and then about, I want to say 12 years ago or so, I left the industry, um, had a couple of uh, children. I'm a single mom by choice. Um, and, uh, and then just started working in uh, clean tech with a startup out of my alma mater, uh, Cornell University, which works um, in the hydrogen space, um, producing, developing technology that allows for the clean energy production from hydrogen gas, renewable stuff. Um, I, I'm not the politician. I, you know, and sometimes people say, wow, you, you know, I kind of sort of drop truth bombs a lot. I'm not your typical politician in that. I really don't filter uh, well. Um, but I got into politics, um, really just because of the, I'm just terrified for the next generation. I look at my own children. Uh, I look at their classmates. Uh, I look at the, you know, I've spent the last 20 years looking at injustices, uh, whether they are environmental or income inequality or racial and have come to realize quite honestly that money in politics is, 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 is the linchpin to a lot of our issues. Even, even if you look at the for-profit prison system, right? I mean, why do we have a for-profit prison system? Their only incentive is to increase incarceration. And how do you do that, right? Uh, you, you know, you ask politicians- Ask draconian to, laws, you criminalize- Exactly, you know, things. war on drugs, whatever, whatever. Um, but that's, that's sort of me. I'm just trying, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm a mother from, the, from New Jersey trying to correct the ills of the world, I suppose, um, starting with the climate change, starting with climate. So you said something which um, uh, is something that I've, I've complained about Democrats saying before, and uh, we don't have to have a fight. It's okay for us to disagree, but I am curious to hear what you think of my reasoning behind this. And you said um, that you're not a politician, and, and I guess I've, I've hit Democrats before for running uh, on exactly that line. I'm not a politician, I built businesses. I'm not a politician, I was in the military, I served our country, that kind of thing. And to me, that kind of thinking, or that kind of rhetoric anyway, it feels to me like it devalues government and the people in it rather than exalts them. And I, I feel like that's why, that's that kind of thinking is part of why we get Mitt Romney running for office and Donald Trump running for office. This notion that, oh, we need business people because they actually do things. And I wonder whether, um, you may not care about my particular reasoning, but I guess I wonder whether there's something rhetorically or strategically that Democrats can or should, if you may disagree, do to sort of say, you know what? Politicians should be really seen with respect. It should be seen as a noble calling and someone who does it for decades, that's really admirable. And you know what? We should spend tax money on giving them a nice office and we should pay them enough money that they can go to the same, you know, places where people who are just as accomplished in the fields they regulate go. That kind of thing. And, and I guess maybe that's too utopian or Pollyanna-ish a, a point of view for the real world, but I am curious to hear your thoughts about it. And it's okay if you want to fight me too. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um... So you're talking about that. And the thing that comes to mind is sort of I, what I've realized politician, right? I've seen, I, there, I've seen that there are two types, right? Um, I at, least. Believe, <laughs> at, at least two types. Uh, the two major categories are, you know, those who are in it for the power or the ego or whatever else it is. Right. 
uh, and those who are uh, in it, and I'll point out Bernie Sanders, who are in it to actually really work for people and be, you know, and take votes and do things that are not politically convenient for their own careers, uh, given the current power structure. Um, I'd like to think I fall into that sort of ladder bucket um, because I am not going, like I said, I'm not going to filter my words. I'm going to I'm going to be in your face and tell you, you know, what I think the problem is, um, regardless of whether democratic leadership is taking money from that particular industry. Right. Um, you know, there are some politicians have been in office for decades. Um, I, <laughs> um, uh, we could talk about term limits, but, um, and I'm not sure where I lie on that. I probably go more towards the side of term limits, but I love the fact that you're not sure. Like I, that I, should be okay, that's right? Okay. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, look, um, I wouldn't be running against somebody uh, who's been in, dec in office for decades if I thought they were doing the right job, right. right? Or if I thought they could handle the problem of the 21st century and they are different than they were in the 20th century. I'm running because I don't think he can. I think he's had his time. He's, we've given him an ample opportunity to prove what he could do uh, and we haven't seen the results. And things that are the things that are coming down the pike, whether it's climate change, whether it's artificial intelligence changing entire industries, how are we going to think about that? Are you going to trust somebody who, who, who hasn't shown that they can react or adapt? Or are you going to give somebody a chance who, you know, maybe has a better background or maybe at least, at least knows, knows when they don't have enough information to make a decision on. And I, there's a lot of times where, you know, people, people complain about me. I'm too, I'm, you know, I'll sit back on the data. I'm like, you know, my team comes to me, let's do this. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But where's the data? You know, that sort of uh, generational difference, you know, all due respect to uh, Bill Pasquale. I just think it's a time, it's time for a change. Our, our, our community, our state, our planet cannot wait uh, another two years. Even two years is, um, we can see a lot of damage happening. Sure, sure. So uh, tell me if I've got this wrong, but according to the FEC website, um, you actually donated to Hillary Clinton in the 2008 primary, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's right, yep. So that, that doesn't sound super, it's, that's okay, right? You're, yeah. You're allowed to do that, but that doesn't sound super consistent with how you're describing yourself politically at this moment. And so I'm wondering is, mm -hmm. if there is a consistency there, if you could walk us through that. And if there was a change in your approach, I'm curious oh, sure. to hear the yeah. um, So I grew up in a Republican household. My parents in the 80s, like a lot of immigrants uh, were, you know, Republican, right? Um, you know, I, I don't know why. Um, and so I have my, 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 uh, well, in defense of your parents, the yeah. party nationally was a very different party at the time. That's true, too. Yes. Right? Yeah. It was more like the centrist Democrats at this point, I think. But um, I basically woke up uh, when Senator Sanders entered the race in uh, 2016. Um, you know, it was always kind of like on the margins and he always said some interesting things. So you kind of, you know, paid attention. But when I saw what he was actually talking about, and quite frankly, the only reason I'm uh, I even considered running was because he inspired me so much. Uh, my my uh, evolution to progressivism has been just that, uh, an evolution. Um, and it really has come down to just plain old thinking. I mean, he's right. There's a lot of injustices in the world. I mean, there's, I mean, where do you start, right? Uh, outside of, that's like five different episodes right there. Um, but yeah, I donated to uh, Hillary Clinton. I voted for Barack Obama. Uh, I was happy that he was elected on a progressive platform, I'll say, uh, back in the day, even though, you know, progressives have some issues with what he actually did to the climate, with the climate, another episode. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I even, you know, I, I donated to Hillary, but I've been donating to Bernie, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so one, I, you know. <laughs> one, one last question, um, and then and then I'll let you tell folks where they can go to find out more about you. Um, so you, this is a fight that I have with Jenk every once in a while. Um, I I'm not where he is on money in politics. I don't dispute that it has an influence, but I also I, I guess I have more of a, a it, well, it doesn't matter. What I'm not running, right? It doesn't matter. The point is. Um, you talk about Pascal getting money. You're not taking corporate money. You're not taking fossil fuel money. But, and again, tell me if I have this wrong, but according to the FEC records, 
a lot of your cash, maybe even most, is, is coming from a loan from yourself. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Now that money, right, your, your personal wealth that enables you to do that, um, that comes from, what was it, Chase Manhattan, Morgan Stanley, the folks you worked for, right? right. So to some extent, does, does, do you not get to claim a moral high ground there if, if, you, if, your, if, that, if that amount of cash from yours actually comes from interests that are similar to the ones that you're disavowing? Right. No, I mean, that's a fair point. I'm not, I'm going to let other people judge the morality of that. Um, I think if I did that, that would be self-serving. Um, yeah, I worked on Wall Street um, and I made uh, a bit of money and I'm financing uh, a large part of this campaign. And I frankly, Jonathan, have restructured my entire life, my children's lives, yeah. uh, because I believe what, I believe in progressive policies so much that I think it is worth it. Um, because I'm not going to sit around in 50 years when, you know, God willing, I'm a grandmother and have my grandchild ask me, grandma, what could you have done when we still had the chance to do anything? I better have a good answer. So if that means, uh, you know, replacing corporate money with a loan to my campaign, I will do that because that's how much this means to me. Um, this is our, this is our kids' futures. Will you tell, uh, tell folks who are watching where they can connect with you, where they can find you, find out more about you? Uh, yes, thanks, thanks for that opportunity. Uh, our website is at zinaforcongress.com, Z-I-N-A-F-O-R-C-O-N-G-R-E-S-S.com. Uh, we have our platform up there. I'm also on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram, pretty easily findable. Not many people have my name, um, I don't think anyone. Um, and you know, we're all, we, we're doing a huge campaign. If, uh, folks in the district want to send feedback to our campaign, uh, we have, uh, you know, a pop-up, uh, and places on our website where we're, uh, actively collecting and responding to feedback from the voters. So. And when's the, when's the primary? Uh, July 7th. Okay. Uh, Zenas Bazakis running for the ninth congressional district democratic nomination against incumbent Bill Pascrell. Thanks so much for joining us here on TYTI Daily. Thanks, Jonathan. And everyone out there, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out on Facebook as well. And as always, take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Bye now.